This is the west coast of Ireland. And in 1944, on this beach, a Canadian airman washed ashore. His aircraft had been patrolling the Atlantic looking for U-boats. And in fact, they had found two. They courageously attacked them, but were shot down during the effort. Of the six crew, only one body was recovered. The locals buried him nearby, and his grave is still there. This is the old cemetery in Ballycanely. During the Second World War, Canadians fought and died throughout the world, in the Far East, in Africa, and in Europe. But there are a few monuments to these men and their achievements, and the only true memorials are their graves. This is the grave of pilot officer Ivor Smithson, 407 Demon Squadron, Coastal Command, Royal Canadian Air Force. He was from Windsor, Ontario, and he died on 11th of March, 1944. And he rests here in Ireland, a long way from home. Ira Smithson was one of more than 40,000 Canadians who died in the Second World War for king and country. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. As war begins in Europe, thousands try to flee. Among them is a family from Hamilton, Ontario, with her parents and her older sister, Margaret. Five-year-old Jacqueline Hayworth boards the liner Athenia, bound for Montreal. After dinner, we went out on deck. The ship was all dark. The lights were out, so submarines couldn't see it. Margaret and I sat on the hatch top, and then the torpedo hit. Shrapnel flew everywhere. A piece tore a gash in Margaret's forehead. Margaret went into the lifeboat. It was the worst moment of my life. Margaret never regained consciousness, and she died a few days later. September 10th the day after Margaret dies. The government of Canada declares war on Nazi Germany and calls for volunteers. In 1939, Canada's armed forces are virtually non-existent. I don't you fit no much more than you can do. But in a few short weeks, 60,000 volunteer for the Army, Navy, and Air Force. This is Mount Royal Cemetery in Montreal, and this is the grave of Canada's greatest soldier, Sir Arthur Currie. Currie commanded the Canadians in the First World War to their great victories in 1918, and he turned the Canadians into the most efficient fighting force on the Western Front. When he died in 1933, his comrades erected this cross of sacrifice, and they used one of Currie's own quotes here at the base. They serve till death, why not we? The Canadians developed a tremendous reputation in the First World War, and in 1939, they passed their torch on to their sons. Christmas, 1939. The first Canadian troops land in Britain. But before they can get into the fight, France falls in June 1940. 
and the defeated British army retreats to England without most of its weapons, leaving the 1st Canadian Division as the only fully armed force left to repel the imminent German invasion. England is alone, and Canada has become her greatest ally. This is London, and these are the Houses of Parliament, a symbol of Britain for more than 150 years. In the summer of 1940, they became a symbol of freedom. After the fall of France, Britain and her empire stood alone, and overnight, Canada became Britain's greatest ally. We had already sent a division here, and they were guarding the southern coast against German invasion, but the first Canadians to see action were the Canadians in the Royal Air Force. The Battle of Britain was to be fought in the air, and these skies for the battlefield. July 1940. The German armies that have conquered Europe are preparing to cross the English Channel and invade Britain. But to win the Battle of Britain, the Germans must have command of the air. They must destroy Britain's Royal Air Force. With no air force, Britain will be defenseless. Now Britain's last line of defense are the fighter pilots. Flying with the Royal Air Force and with the Royal Canadian Air Force are more than 100 Canadians. Among them is a 24-year-old flight lieutenant, Robert Barton. I was very fond of flying. It was like driving a car, only you were you were having a much more fun still. I was a, a very much afraid always on takeoff. I found that uh, when we started to get up uh, gaining altitude, I found that if you sighted the enemy, a lot of your fear disappeared. It was rather marvelous because, God, there's, there they are. There they are. You've, you've, you've had it, boy. This is it. There were a hundred of them at least. That, to me, was, was something unbelievable. We attacked, and the first aircraft I shot at um, didn't do anything. It just, it just stayed in, in formation. Then I tried another one. And as he went down, I followed him. And I followed him all the way. I said, all right, I'm going, this one, I'm going to make sure he's bloody well down. Because this, this, is, this is a crazy business. Though they shoot down many enemy aircraft, the pilots of the RAF and RCAF are vastly outnumbered facing a massive German fleet of over 3,000 fighters and bombers. This now is the crucial battlefield. This is Duxford Airstrip, north of London. In 1940, it was a fighter base, and it was from bases such as this, all across southern England, that the Battle of Britain was fought. And this is the legendary Spitfire. This Spitfire has Polish markings. There were a number of Polish squadrons in the Battle of Britain. In fact, one of them was commanded by a Canadian Johnny Kent of Winnipeg. You can see the armament over here. This is the machine guns. They'd fire 303 bullets, and there's two on this side, of course, two on the other. And they're operated from the cockpit. But you can actually see the sights up here. And there's the joystick with the button controlling the machine guns. The Spitfire was a beautifully designed plane. It's sleek, and it was the darling of the Battle of Britain. But the true workhorse was the Hurricane. Leading a squadron of Hurricanes is 26-year-old Johnny Kent. The North Old Wing was scrambled with myself leading three squadrons, a grand total of nine airplanes, all that was left on our airfield. We climbed to about 11,000 feet, and then without any warning, there was a loud bang as my engine blew out and caught fire. 
My aircraft rapidly lost speed, and the other aircraft shot past me. All except one. It was Hilly Brown, who called me on the radio saying, Ha, bloody ha, you getting hot in there, bud? This was for a lot of ribbing I've been giving him for having been shot down and burnt a few days before. There are two groups of Canadians in the Battle of Britain. The largest group were Canadians who enlisted in the RAF in the late 1930s. These men had battle experience in France, and there's even a couple aces amongst them, Hilly Brown and Johnny Kent. The other group was 401 Squadron RCAF, and they joined the battle in late August 1940. Between the two, 100 Canadians fought in the Battle of Britain, and one in five did not survive. In the first weeks of the battle, both the RAF and the Germans lose many planes over the Channel and southern England. But in the last weeks of August, the Luftwaffe shifts the attack to the RAF itself to prepare the way for the invasion of England. This is the North Weald airstrip, and in 1940 it was home to Butch Barton's 249 squadron. North Weald was attacked in September 1940. The German Henkel bombers came over this direction here, and of course they caught the hurricanes on the ground. The men had to scramble, get into the aircraft, and get off while the airstrip is blowing up and being strafed by German fighters. Holy Christmas, everything was coming down on top of us. Bombs, etc., etc. And all I could do was look up and see our aircraft above. And if there, that, that stuff was coming down, God damn it, it had to be enemy aircraft. So I took off and flew into it. They were so busy trying to get home. They were not defending anything, they were just flying out. They'd done an attack and they were homeward bound. But little did they know that they got a few enemy aircraft right in their midst. And, and shot at three quite seriously. Life for a Battle of Britain pilot was very stressful. They waited their dispersal from dawn to dusk They usually scramble three, four times a day. They always encountered the enemy, and they were usually outnumbered. This took a terrible toll on the pilots of the RAF, and by mid-September 1940, they were losing the Battle of Britain. When you just think you're going to get one, and you get hit, that's a very na nasty thing. Say, oh, hell, that, that's great, that's bad. Oh my God, the damn thing, the airplane's on fire. What a disappointment. And what fear now? What fear? How do I get out of this damn thing? As I fell through the sky, I said, well, now you better open your parachute. You better find that the, the rip cord uh, on the parachute at your chest. Now find that, fella. You're falling through the sky. And when I finally landed, I didn't roll over anything. I just stripped the tree down, and there I was, standing at the bottom with a stripped pear tree in somebody's backyard. And some days I'd be shot down, and I would come back in the same day and fly another airplane into the battle. By early September, the Germans believe the RAF is finished. This is the green light for the invasion. September 7th. Throughout Britain, church bells ring out the warning. The German invasion is imminent. Now the Germans turn their air assault on London. 
believing terror will bring the British to their knees. This is London Bridge, and on the afternoon of September the 7th, 1940, Londoners could hear the approach of a thousand German planes. But what they didn't know is that the Germans were coming directly at the city. And you can imagine their terror when they looked up in the sky and saw these formations of German bombings coming right over the city, dropping their bombs, the explosions, the anti-aircraft fire, and the whole city was ablaze. Within a couple hours, London had more than a thousand fires. The terror bombing of the city had begun. In the evening, we were scrambled after a raid. On the way home, it was just about dusk, I could see the fires in London that the Luftwaffe had started on this, their first raid on London itself. I don't think I've ever been so angry, and I found myself beating my fists against the sides of the cockpit in a fury. It was a strange experience. I had not realized I could feel so deeply. At that moment, I would have butchered any German I could lay my hands on. bombing had severely damaged the city, but it had not intimidated the British. In fact, it had strengthened their resolve and their thirst for revenge. But the Germans weren't finished yet. Hitler was planning on delivering the knockout blow. One day, we were told, this is your last day. Tomorrow, the invasion is going to occur. That was not very encouraging. Holy Christmas. We've come this far, and this is where we are. And uh, I tell you, fellas, as soon as we're off duty tonight, I'm into the bar pretty quickly. I'm going to get myself a few, a few glasses of beer. September 15th, the Germans launched their massive assault on London. If the British lose their last fighters trying to save the city, the way will be open for the invasion. This will be the decisive day of the battle. We did everything to get at the enemy quickly. I'd come down from a considerable altitude above him, and I had speed on. At that time, he turned then and turned to fight. And I had to, a great difficulty in getting, getting behind him again. Every time I closed up with him, he turned, turned to fight. He climbed up into a cloud, and he thought he was going to be safe. It was just great. When I came out of the cloud, they were, there he was in front of me. And that was his bad luck. During the day, the Canadians shoot down 11 aircraft. In all, the Luftwaffe loses almost 60 planes. Germany has failed to gain air superiority over Great Britain. Two days later, the planned German invasion of England is canceled. The Canadians in the Battle of Britain shot down over a hundred planes. Well, we did really know that we were in the last ditch. If that had failed, 
the Battle of Britain. That had been the end of Britain. And that would have been Germany had won the war and everything else and, and all over the world. Do you realize what would have happened? They'd have taken over everything. Everything. They'd have loved it. This is Canuck Chase German War Cemetery in Britain. It contains the graves of more than 300 Germans killed during the Battle of Britain. And typical of all the main German cemeteries, the visitor is met by a sculpture. In this case, it's a shroud-draped corpse. And typical of all the German cemeteries, it's very bleak and very sober. In the summer of 1940, the Germans lose the battle in the air. Now, as winter approaches, they shift their attack to the sea. October 1940. As winter approaches, Britain is now isolated, an island surrounded by Nazi-occupied Europe. And to survive, Britain needs to import hundreds of tons of food, fuel, and weapons every day. And these vital supplies can only come in ships from Canada across 3,000 kilometers of the North Atlantic. Hoping to cut the vital North Atlantic supply line, Germany launches a fleet of submarines known as the U-Boat. Sailing into the Atlantic, the U-Boat set out to hunt down and destroy the supply ships. For protection against the U-Boats, the ships must form up into huge convoys and the only place big enough and safe enough is Canada's east coast seaport, Halifax. The collapse of Europe in 1940 left Britain isolated, and her only chance of survival was to be supplied by transatlantic convoys, and the only port that could do this was Halifax. So Halifax went from being a backwater to the most important harbor in the world. This is the Bedford Basin, and it was here that the merchant ships would collect hundreds at a time to be formed up into convoys to make the perilous journey to England. There was no doubt that victory depended on whether or not these convoys could get through. Between June 1940 and May 1941, almost over a quarter of Britain's merchant fleet is lost. With such losses, Britain cannot hope to survive the year. Dozens of U-boats now move into the mid-Atlantic and station themselves along the long line stretching from just south of Greenland to the Bay of Biscay, with the boats 25 to 30 kilometers apart. When a U-boat spots the merchantmen, he radios the location. Other U-boats gather in a wolf pack to attack and destroy the convoy. To combat the U-boat menace, much of the job of defending the convoys falls to the Royal Canadian Navy, a navy which, when the war begins, has less than a dozen fighting ships. Canada rushes to build a new, cheap, simple anti-submarine warship. It will be known as the Corvette. By the end of 1940, 80 of these small ships roll out of the shipyards and into service. But as more and more merchantmen are lost, every merchant ship of every type, new and old, slow and fast, is pressed into service in the convoys. By the fall of 1941, Canada's tiny corvettes and raw crews are ordered to protect the slow convoys sailing from Sydney, Nova Scotia. This is Sydney Harbor. Although Halifax was the principal port for the convoys, Sydney was also used throughout the war. 
In 1940, the Admiralty decided the convoys would be split into two types. The HX series, which were the fast series of ships speeding at 10 to 15 knots, would sail from Halifax. And the SC series, which were the old clunkers, which would sail at speeds of 6 to 9 knots, would sail from Sydney. SC-42 was one of those convoys. August 30th, 1941. The slow convoy 42 forms up. 62 ships, half a million tons of cargo, and 2,700 men from seven nations begin to move slowly out of Sydney Harbor, headed for Britain. Across 3,000 kilometers of some of the coldest, deadliest waters in the world. And gathering to wait for them are the U-boats of the German wolf pack, Mark Graf. August 30th, 1941. Slow convoy number 42 forms up to set sail from Sydney Harbor. Loaded with just enough supplies to help England survive for a few more days. Once the ships were set to sail, each merchant seaman would calculate his odds of survival if he was torpedoed. And there was two things that contributed to that. One was his station within the convoy. A convoy was a series of columns and rows, and of course it was the outside ships which were the easiest targets. The second was the cargo you were carrying. Iron ore or steel, your ship would sink immediately, usually with loss of all hands. If you had wood, your ship would remain buoyant, and then the crew could get off. But the worst of all was the tanker. They were the primary target of the German U-boats, and it would be a very long trip across the Atlantic if you made it at all. With slow convoy number 42, our ships carrying steel, iron ore, phosphates, and tankers laden down with oil. These ancient plodding ships that often fall behind are easy prey for the U-boats. The ships would have sailed in a line coming from Sydney Harbor over here in single file going out to the ocean. There were 63 merchantmen, some tramp steamers, some tankers, even some ocean-going tugs. It was sort of an incredible convoy. And of course, it had a lot of old duds with it, so they'd all be steaming out because they're all coal-fired. And they would have this beautiful procession of ships with their flags and pennants going, heading right out into the unknown. Under sunny skies, SC-42 heads north, crossing the Gulf of St. Lawrence. But in the Strait of Belle Isle, the convoy enters iceberg fields. Fog closes in. Crowded close together, often only a few hundred meters apart, the ships can easily enter into a fatal collision with an iceberg or with each other. Nervously, each ship signals its warnings. As SC-42 enters the open ocean, the fog lifts. And the convoy rendezvous with its ocean escort, the Canadian destroyer Skeena, and three corvettes, the Aurelia, the Alberni, and the Kanagami. As the convoy sails out into the Atlantic, it moves beyond the protection of land-based aircraft into the U-boat-dominated zone the sailors fear, the Black Pit. Now only three Canadian corvettes and one destroyer stand between SC-42 and the deadly U-boats of Wolfpack Mark Graf. This 
This is His Majesty's Canadian ship Sackville, and it's one of 120 Canadian-built corvettes from the Second World War. In fact, it is today the only survivor. The corvette was designed for anti-submarine patrols to escort convoys, but particularly to counter the U-boat threat in the North Atlantic. One of the problems with the Corvette, of course, was its size. It wasn't really designed for full Atlantic crossings. And you can see right across here how small this ship was. And in the heavy gales and the high seas of the North Atlantic, this thing would pitch and roll, and it was a real thing for its crew to survive. It really tested the crew going across. Small, highly maneuverable, adept at making quick turns, the Corvette is perfect for chasing U-boats, but it is also slow and highly unstable, not ideal for sailing the stormy North Atlantic. Of the 90 sailors on the Corvette Kanagami, only one in four has ever been to sea. One of these experienced sailors is 22-year-old Peter Koch, assigned to a Corvette for the first time. Shortly after we joined, we had a three-day storm and uh, this was very rough and it scattered the convoy. And there's nothing we could do except heave to. You'd be standing on the bridge and a wave would be higher than the, uh, higher than the mast of the ship. And you think, you know, if that falls on us, that's it. But suddenly you just rode up the side of the wave and you, you on top, looking down into a valley of more waves. I used to go down into the Aztec hut when it was a really bad storm. My Aztec operator and I, he was from Calgary. We used to sing, my, I miss your apple pie. <laughs> I don't know why, but it just sort of broke the tension. My, I miss your apple pie. Oh, mama, I miss you too. The merchant ships were getting scattered. They couldn't go anywhere, and we would just had to wait for them, more or less. And uh, then after the storm disappeared, we had to go and find the ships and get them all collected together again, and the convoy went on. This is before we were attacked by the submarines. Lying just ahead, anxiously searching the vast horizon for the convoy, are the U-boats of Wolfpack Markgraf. Hoping to go around the Wolfpacks, the convoy slowly swings north towards the Arctic Circle, hugging the eastern coast of Greenland. But luck is against the convoy now halfway through its 20-day journey. The storm has left some of the older ships of SC-42 struggling, their coal-fired boilers belching heavy black smoke. And in the clear, warming air, the smoke rises up hundreds of meters. Dawn, 9 September. 26-year-old Eberhard Greger commanding U-boat 85, spots a brown smudge on the distant horizon, a convoy. Calling the U-boats in for the kill, Gregor races northward, and after three hours, he sees silhouetted on the horizon a slow-moving city of ships, convoy SC-42. I spotted smoke plumes and maneuvered into position in front of the convoy for an attack. Three torpedoes missed, and one failed to leave the torpedo tubes. I fired at a straggler behind the convoy. Just at this moment, the steamer turned towards me. The shot also missed. What a dismal start. It must be because it's our 13th day at sea. Knowing that they are in the Black Pit, and still unaware that the U-boats have found them, the men of the escort anxiously scan the ocean for any sign of the enemy.
today the Sackville is a museum and you can see it's winter time and all the equipment is covered up for its own protection. But during the war, this would be wide open to the elements. There wouldn't be any roof, no plastic. And of course the waves in the, in the high seas would be coming over here and the men on the watch and the captains during the attacks would be here trying to figure out what was going on. And for the most part, they wouldn't know an attack was happening until the first merchantman exploded. Joining the U-boats, gathering for the kill, is 26-year-old Heinz Otto Schultz, commanding U-boat 432. Radio message from U-85. Enemy convoy in sight. Maneuver to position myself ahead. The convoy is zigzagging. Dive to attack. When the last ships in the convoy are visible in the moonlight, fire four single shots. SS Munerich is the first hit. Filled with iron ore, it sinks in seconds. Of the crew of 63, there are no survivors. Well, of course, SC-42, I said, was about the worst because <clears throat> we lost a lot of ships. We were attacked by about 20 submarines over a period of days and nights. And they were blowing up uh, a, a minute or two apart. And then there was survivors in the water or in boats, and you couldn't stop to pick them up because you had to go after a, a submarine contact. Our responsibility was to get the convoys across safely. That was our first concern because without the supplies coming in for the war effort, <clears throat> the, you know, England would have uh, collapsed. If a tanker was uh, blown up, <clears throat> the sea would be covered in oil, spreading out and out, and usually there would be uh, survivors swimming in it. And quite often on convoys, the oil will catch fire, so you had fire burning. And survivors in it, they could dive under the water, but they still had to come up for air, and they just come up in flames. At times, on many convoys, we had more survivors on board than we had crewmen. A lot of the survivors, of course, died in the night, and all we could do was uh, haul the bodies up and lay them on the deck. And uh, eventually we'd sew them into blankets, put a projectile at their feet so that they would sink when we buried them. In a few hours, five ships of convoy SC-42 have been sunk. And only three corvettes and one destroyer stand between what's left of the convoy and the gathering U-boats. Dawn, September 10th, 1941. In a few hours, five merchant ships of slow convoy SC-42 have been sunk by German U-boats. And now the convoy's escorts use their sonar, or ASDEC, in a desperate search for the enemy U-boats. This little, uh, little room is the ASDEC room, and this was the technology center of the, of the ship in terms of trying to find the U-boats. 
ASDIC is really a sonar, so it's a sound wave that's sent out underwater. And if you've got a really clear ping, that means you've got a metallic hull, which is going to be a sub. And during an attack, such as on a convoy, you wanted your best man in this operation. Getting an enemy contact, Commander Jimmy Hibbert, head of the convoy's escort, zigzags his destroyer Skeena up and down the convoy, determined to protect the merchantmen from the submarines. Hibbert races towards Eberhard Greger's U-85, determined to destroy the submarine. Depth charges rain down and pound U-85. This is a depth charge, which is really a barrel full of a couple hundred pounds of high explosives, or TNT. And the idea, of course, is to put a, put a detonator on it once you know the depth that you want it to explode at. So you're going to pick that up from your ASDIC. Your sonar is going to pick up where the sub is, and then you're going to put your detonator on so it's going to explode at, let's say, 80 feet. So here you go. You got it all set up. Depth charge is up here. It's going to sit in a cradle or a saddle type item. And then you're going to launch them in a pattern, which is usually five torpedoes in a clover shape. So boom, it's going to go out. Now the only problem, of course, was with the depth charge is after the boat found the sub, it had to advance and then fire them from the rear. And often in the wake and in the explosives, the Aztec would lose the sub. And of course, the sub again are very wily, and they would disappear. Desperately trying to avoid the Skeena's depth charges, U-85 dives. Six depth charges explode at close range. All manometers except the main one are knocked out, as are the depth rudder, gyro compass, the magnetic compass, the side rudder, the engine room telegraph, and all lighting. The port engine stops. The boat descends, but the dive is arrested at depth 85 meters by trimming, moving the crew aft and running our engine at three-quarter speed. Severely damaged by Skeena's depth charges, U-85 limps away, back to base. As the remaining U-boats continue their assault, two additional Canadian corvettes, the Chambly and the Moose Jaw, arrive on the scene and immediately swing into the fight. 21-year-old Lieutenant Hal Lawrence is serving on the Moose Jaw. The radio telephone blurted a message from the Chambly. I have a good contact. I'm attacking. And I rang, action stations. Chambly said, firing now. black metal snout reared out, U-501. We gave chase. The captain was maneuvering to ram. With our primitive weapons, this was the surest way for a kill. With U-boat 501 dead in the water, the Chambly sends over a boarding party, hoping to capture the submarine and seize its secret code books but the Germans have already scuttled the U-boat. In the boarding party is 22-year-old stoker William Brown. As the Canadians climb into the submarine, water suddenly rushes up from below. The Canadians scramble to get off U-501, but Stoker Brown is trapped. Most of the German crew is rescued by the Canadians, but as it sinks, U-501 pulls Stoker William Brown down into the depths of the sea. The attack on convoy SC-42 cost 14 ships and 40,000 tons of cargo. 45 ships did make it to England, carrying enough food and fuel to help England survive for a few more days but getting it there cost the lives of more than 200 Allied seamen.
This is the Halifax Memorial, and it commemorates the Canadians that perished at sea and whose bodies were never recovered. And that means most men of the Royal Canadian Navy or the Canadian Merchant Navy are all listed on these panels. SC-42 lost about 200 men, and of course, most of them are British, so they're commemorated in England. There are five Canadians listed on this panel, and one of them is right here in the Royal Canadian Naval Reserve. Stoker William Brown was on the HMCS Chambly, and he drowned when they were trying to board U-501 during the convoy attack. The Battle of the Atlantic raged for three more years. And it wasn't until mid-1943 that the Allies got the advantage over the U-boats. But in a war of hard-won victories, the Battle of the Atlantic was the most important victory. More than 120,000 Canadians served in the Navy and Merchant Marine, ensuring that Britain survives. But victory in the Atlantic comes at a high price. Over 2,000 Canadians died 